I see some of the hedge fund manager maybe is thinking of implementing this uh, trading strategy and uh, ho potentially, hopefully, can make some profit for the company. Um, so I really uh, con con like to congratulate in, uh, Professor uh, Passeron for this uh, st you know, uh, interesting work and uh, stu stimulating talk. Now I'd like to you know, uh, uh, invite questions from the floor. Um, good morning, Prof. Thank you for your talk. My name is Yen Chin. I'm currently a year four student undergraduate in SMU. So I've been involved personally in uh, developing trading systems using statistics, econometrics, and so on. Um, just one a few questions. Um, does your results, what's the, does your results differ if you use um, maybe weekly rolling returns or daily returns uh, besides, uh, instead of monthly returns? And what is the pros and cons in using uh, different frequencies for doing backtesting or your analysis, for example? It's for my personal interest. And secondly, um, you talked about data snooping bias, which is really a big problem. Is there any ways to eliminate data snooping bias? Uh, one way that I read up was the White's uh, reality check. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar. And another one is your recursive modeling, which I think is very interesting, which I'll check out when I get back. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for the question. The first question was, what is the effect of uh, using different uh, frequency on the results? We haven't done it. The, the, the reason we haven't done it, because it takes so much effort to download all the data. Uh, remember, we have to do it at every point in time to get rid of the survivorship bias. Uh, so we will do it in the future. And hopefully other people could do it because we're making the paper available in a month's time at least, or maybe even earlier, as soon as we write uh, the new results up. And I'm hoping that the, the new test can be used in many different contexts and see what results we come up with. Because we, some of the Monte Carlo, I didn't explain, some of the Monte Carlo we have done is really promising because the size of the test controlled and the power is very, very high. Uh, and the reason is that because the power depends on N uh, and it's uh, not T. Uh, so it's really promising. So I don't think there is any reason why it shouldn't be applied at that level and the lower frequencies. Uh, in terms of data snooping, I'm uh, aware of a reality check. Uh, in, in fact, uh, Alan Timmerman, we discussed it. I think that's for exposed analysis. But if you want to uh, basically developing a strategy of predicting in real time, you need to do something what I've been explaining, re uh, recursive uh, modeling. Uh, now, recursive modeling is just a, a name, but what it does, it basically says at every point in time, you have to consider uh, a number of predefined set of uh, models which you decide before looking at the world. Because if you look at the world exposed, it basically automatically makes you to know something which you couldn't have done in real time. The question is how you simulate real time. That's the word to use. How do you simulate real time? Think about it. Very difficult. I, I spend a lot of time thinking about the subject. You, you can get rid of the benefit of the hindsight to some extent, but you cannot eradicate it. Any other question? Yes? Hello, hi, Professor. Thank you for, for your time. I found this very powerful result. Um, as a, as a, an indication of uh, testing the predictive ability, uh, have you or, or would it make sense to run uh, volatilities uh, against the, the data that where you compared long short minus the, the, the S&P 500? Um, and specifically, obviously, and as you conjectured, we'd expect a very positive correlation to, to that specific return profile. The question is, uh, would it make sense to use the implied volatility and the options on those securities over the same period um, as a gauge for that volatility and, and to try to derive a predictability feature using the second or perhaps even third derivative of those option functions? that are publicly available, obviously, and, and, and trade with some liquidity, uh, given the S&P 500. So that's, that's part one, uh, I guess, of the question. And, and secondly, um, more along the lines of, of value, does it, uh, do you think that that provides a, a means to validate uh, what you've come up with rather than kind of expanding the theory into how, how to make money with, with finance? Sorry. Thanks so much for, I mean, uh, I agree with you that um, 
it's possible now to try to explain why we get predictability you know, relating it to volatility. Uh, I agree, but the reason I, we didn't do it here was because we wanted to know how uh, the test results relates to prof exploiting the profit. But then the question is, under what condition is predictability arises? We haven't addressed your, I alluded to it earlier on in my talk, but we haven't did it empirically. Sorry, as, as a quick follow-up, I think that my part P of the question was, um, volatility tends to follow bad news in, in various forms. And as you're looking at individual stocks in the market, um, what we could do, uh, presumably, and this is the question for you, would, would it make sense to use the second or even third derivative of the option, the implied value function in the option prices, um, and correlate that to bad news, uh, either at the stock level or even macroeconomic level, and then, and then formulate regression around those results in order to create predictivity tables? No, I, I agree, but, uh, I, but I didn't really address the more derivative uh, subject, which is very important, but I agree that there are uh, implications in other areas of finance one could exploit, one of them the one you just said. The, the problem is that uh, the volatility, it's, although it's clustering, it's also difficult to predict. Uh, somebody asked me, you have been in a hedge fund, because I did develop a trading system for Tudor. <laughs> so, uh, I, but it was before, you know, it was, I went there in 1999, and I was there with them for three years. And, uh, but I wanted to be in an academic life, so I just didn't stay long enough to develop the trading uh, strategies. But we, I did develop a few trading strategies. One thing, uh, it was clear to me uh, that it is possible to predict uh, and during the time that you're predicting, it's very likely that the more volatile periods, right? the, the, but it's difficult to know when the volatility comes. So, so the, the question is when you link predictability with some other measure like volatility or option pricing or uh, implied volatility, all the things you discussed, then you need to know when you predict those. The, the, my ex experience is that they are as difficult to predict. Uh, and also, the, you could look at what happened last week. There were not much good news, but the market gone up. Uh, last, this month is the last day. <laughs> Hopefully, it doesn't, it doesn't collapse today. It's the largest rise we have had since 1974. And there were not any great news that you could think about that you all would be happy with. So I don't think it is uh, any... I mean, while your, your, uh, your argument is correct, in other words, the evidence empirically supports what you're saying. But whether you can exploit it, I think it, there are some problems. But, but I agree, I agree. It's a nice line of research to follow. Quick one. I didn't really understand the title, uh, Predictability and Efficient Market Hypothesis. I understand the result of the paper, basically you're pushing the GRI statistics. But for instance, bond prices, they're highly predictable. So? Am I saying these markets are inefficient because I can predict the bond price tomorrow? Well, I did. Uh, I, I tried to explain. Uh, you, you, you see that uh, there is, uh, if you believe the market uh, are uh, not risk neutral, you see, that's your attitude. Your attitude is still the old fashioned <laughs> way, right? You come from Chicago, most likely. Uh, so, uh, I've talked to a lot. In fact, uh, when I wrote the book, The Limits to Russian Expectation, it was Jim Heckman who asked me to go to Chicago and present it when Sargent and Hanson and all these people were there. Now, even Sargent now agrees, uh, not, not, not because he was a Nobel Prize, because often they change their minds when they need a Nobel Prize. The, even Sargent agreed that learning is important and Russian expectation models are not necessarily valid. I mean, he has written a lot of work on learning, as you know. My point here is that the, the representative agent model that you use in order to uh, attack my argument is invalid. You have to prove to me first that representative agent model is correct. It's not correct. If you, don't, if, if you then follow what I just said, I showed you, maybe I didn't, wasn't good enough to explain all the detail, that even if you have risk averse individuals and assume heterogeneity, the average becomes risk neutral if the number of traders go to infinity. I think this is what you may want to discuss with me after. If I convince you of that, you, can, you have to agree then, you could have individuals who are risk averse, the market risk neutral, therefore predictability is against market efficiency. 
in that setting. Now, if you say, no, all individuals are the same, and the risk aversion, I know what it is, whose risk aversion are we talking about when people talk about the asset pricing model? When you write down your asset pricing model with the internal optimization and specific agent and utility function, and you say this risk aversion of that agent, which agent are we talking about? Yourself or us? Which one? What happens to the average? I plead with you to do work on that. Then we have a better constructive conversation. At the moment, if you come from the old-fashioned way, I have nothing to say. I pass you by. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Professor Pesaret. Uh, uh, so in the first half of your talk, uh, you suggest that uh, market efficiency and inefficiency coexist. Uh, uh, and in the second half, you basically use your task. That, uh, looking back at the data, you are able to judge when the market is more like efficient and when uh, the market is not likely efficient, right? So I wonder that uh, uh, exactly are you able to predict uh, well when the market is more likely efficient or not? I think it's a very uh, good question. Firstly, I have to, if I may, just correct the verb, the terminology. I didn't say they coexist. I said there are some periods could be efficient. Yes. So coexist means they are at the same time. But you're right. Yeah. So, no. yeah. so, so, yeah. so long as we agree that. I, my argument suggests that if you allow for the genuity beliefs mm -hmm. and you allow for correlation across traders, there are some periods the market become efficient, some periods not. Right? I did not suggest I can predict which time is efficient ahead of the time or not. The evidence I showed at the end wasn't an exante analysis. It said if you did the, calculate the p-values for market efficiency, and look backward and see whether hedge fund did it. Because I didn't do the trading strategy. I relied on what was the average return of hedge funds. Okay? I said, look, it just happens that the hedge fund who were doing it ex ante, remember all the hedge funds could not make the money exposed, could they? Right? The hedge fund return is ex ante. It turns out the ex ante, they were only managing to make money relative to the market when the market, my indicator was inefficient. You see, there's a subtle difference between me being able to predict or saying that what people who did ex ante analysis match with what the test I do suggest. I haven't done what your question implies which I should do, which I think is a good point. Can we use this methodology to more also see what is the chances of us predicting market inefficiency? Mm -hmm. That's, I don't know the answer. Okay, yeah. Also have two quick comments. Uh, in the second part of your tests, uh, you look at SP500, and you look at individual stock beta, uh, alpha, right? But uh, uh, we all know that the, uh, the market tends to be more efficient in those larger well, stocks, larger market cap stocks. I wonder that if you extend your methodology analysis into all the stocks in the market, well, you might have identify more periods of market inefficiency using your methods, right? I think, again, uh, it's an important point. The reason why we took uh, uh, 500, uh, there is a still some a small one in there. But I mean, you're right. There is not uh, all the 2,000. You could go with the 2,000 index uh, to, uh, in the US. And we could look at other countries. Remember, the point of my analysis was to develop a test and to show you it's possible to test them when there is a lot of uh, uh, securities and T is small. Now, if I went to 2000 and took T60, I am not sure whether the test would still work, but I have to check that. Yep. This is what I mean. The larger the number of assets you have, mm -hmm. they may have a problem, but the test we have done up to 500, when we did the Monte Carlo, it works perfectly all right. Uh -huh. The trouble is it's so costly to do this test when N become very, very large. Okay. Because of the number, I mean, but we have, and the data and so on. Mm -hmm. So we are at the beginning. But I'm hoping other students here elsewhere could try it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I would definitely send the paper here and then would be on my web page. Uh, it's very easy to implement. It take, takes time to download the data. Without, remember, I don't want survivorship bias in my data. Mm -hmm. I think the people who just use the same data and then just roll it over and then firm keep dropping. It's not a good idea. They could subject to more problems. But you're perfectly right. We could do it for a small stocks, large stocks, and compare the results. Yeah, but we but haven't. It's the beginning. Yeah, but my point is uh, your final conclusion results might depend on 
the way yeah you you deal with a whole larger data is. Yeah, but remember, if you yeah. talk about the U.S. market and ask whether it's efficient or not, the U.S. market, uh -huh. SP 500 plays a very important thing in that question. Okay. But if you ask whether small stocks are more efficient than large stocks, mm -hmm. then we haven't done it yet. Okay. So I think we chose the right set of stocks, in my opinion, to answer the question of the whole uh, SP, uh, no, the whole, the, the, as an indicator of a general efficiency or inefficiency of the U.S. market. Yeah, so, sorry to taking up the time. Just one last quick comment. Uh, you are arguing that the benefit of uh, working on the individual stock uh, alpha rather than in the past people work on uh, the portfolio level alpha. Uh, but I also wonder that uh, there are some benefits for us to work on the portfolio level, at least it to like cancel out some uh, impact from firm specific errors, firm specific information. So, of course, you have arguments that, well, due to some like uh, inappropriate assumption on errors across stocks at uh, the same, uh, same time, uh, but I wonder, well, whether you can justify the benefits by using individual stock alpha can outweigh uh, the cost or the, the, the other benefits we can get uh, from portfolio level test. Uh, in a, uh, thanks so much. Uh, in the paper, we do discuss the problems, I mean, I haven't, didn't have time to go through this. The problem with using portfolio, it, it's valid if you want to just to know whether that portfolio is efficient relative to the market. But if you ask yourself about market efficiency in general, that's a separate question, right? So I, 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 it is quite valid that if you are interested in a particular portfolio, you want to do that. The question was the, the way we live in, suppose we didn't know whose portfolio we're going to consider and you can construct many, many portfolios out of the 500 stocks. You're suggesting in a minute ago we should go to 2,000 stocks, or even more. Now, as the number is increases, the number of possible portfolios you can construct is mind-boggling. So then the number of tests you have to carry in the GRS framework would be so huge that we would be, uh, econometrician would tell you, it would be almost impossible to tell what the size of that test is. Uh, how about we have a... Uh because of the time limit, you know, I, uh, we have uh, two hands here. Uh, how about we invite uh, both questions at the same time? And, uh, and if you don't mind, please answer the question. Thank you very much, Chairman. Yeah. Sir. Uh, well, my apology, I was a bit late. So I miss your definition with regard to your term of reference. Uh, uh, see, Prof, when you talk about efficient market, when you talk about efficient and what your definition be, your regularity, regularity, and the question is that how the proficiency dimension. At the same time, when you talk about that, you may have to also uh, you know, define in terms of not just the value aspect of the dimension of your analysis, but also the virtue that you know that coming by with it. So the hidden part, not just the obvious part. So how does you integrate the totality vis-a-vis -vis in reality of when you say a reality market, not just an efficient market? So how does you really, uh, you know, predicts the unpredictability and yet making it possible. Thanks a lot. You have a question? We can take a two questions. If you, Xunia, Xunia, you have a question? Um, my question was, when you set up the, the model earlier, and talking about the heterogeneity and expectations, um, you talked about an uh, unchanging underlying true expectation. Now, when I think of the market, if the distribution of expectations in the market itself influences the market outcome, then you don't have the under, underlying unchanged uh, uh, expectation. So there's this feedback. Is that being allowed in, 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 in the setup that you had? Because, because when I think about herding, I, I think of a shock to the market, either because there's a, something has changed or there's less information available about something. Um, the market outcome depends very much on how each of the heterogeneous agent um, filters this yeah, new information, and the dynamics of the market would be quite different. Uh, the point I'm trying to get is the, the epi episodes that you isolate, which say that this is when the market was inefficient or, or not efficient. Um, there could be a common cause for that, um, given the changes either in, 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 in the market structure or in the, in, in the macro environment. 
And that's what's being picked up. Uh, I, sorry, I uh, try to explain that I'm using market efficiency concept the same way as the literature in finance does. Because after all, I'm not inventing the concept. I'm, I'm using, the way I was using it uh, is that saying that all individual, you do the best they can, they have the model uh, of the property distribution of the world they live in, and the subjective is a savage, uh, a la savage is a subjective you calculate. You, you, so I'm assuming all agents are doing the best they can. It's not rational in that sense. I'm not assuming any rationality. That's number one. So I, I don't go along that route. I mean, I'm not saying that people don't understand, they don't learn. They do their best. My point here is that even if you do your best and use the same data or similar data, firstly, they cannot use all the same data because the data is costly and so on, but even if you use the same data, because of the modeling is uncertain, we as econometricians know that. We live by it. You would come across, you come with a different answer. Look at, look at this room. I mean, is, it, is it really meaningful to say we all, if I give you the same data and the same problem, you come with the same answer? It's not true. I'm saying let's accept that. That's the only thing I'm saying. That's the answer to yours as well. I mean, just please accept that. It's not true that we come with the same answer. Right? That's the only thing I'm saying. So apart from that, I'm not deviating from the concepts of rationality or anything. In fact, in the book on limits to rational expectation, I use the word limit because in Cambridge I was influenced by Wittgenstein, the famous philosopher, that he says to understand the meaning of anything, you need to know what his limitation is. He said in order to understand what is the use of a glass is to know what is you cannot use it for. Because if I say this glass, I can use it for drinking wine, you could drink poison in it. You have to say what it cannot be done. To understand deep concept, we need to really understand the limitations of those concepts. The rational expectation is a good idea as a subjective view of the way we behave as individually. But it's not a good idea as the collective behavior of the world we live in. Because you have to average. Okay? Uh, going back, if I don't know whether I answered your question, so it's okay. yeah, I tried anyway. Uh, these are philosophical issues as well. And, uh, Sunil, I actually got a slide, uh, one of the items in my slide does say that when you allow for heterogeneous expectation, there is a feedback effect on the market. So I, I understand. But then whether that, that complicates the story doesn't change the nature of my conclusion. It complicates it because then you need to know what sort of feedback. Is it important? It's not. What is objective reality? As soon as you have feedbacks, the concept of objective reality, that's why I said in quote, becomes not defined. Because the outcome of a, the, you know, it's a, this is like a beauty context of Keynes, right? It becomes that. What is beauty? What, what, is, what is the right price of an asset? In fact, with Alan Timmerman, we have a paper. We show that when you allow for uncertainty of return, the mean and the variance of return is uncertain, right? And you calculate the present value. Think of what we're doing. Present value means you calculate ad to infinitum. Let's say 1,000 years from now. What is the value of this asset? and discounting to, to, to present. We rely on discounting to ignore the fact that we don't know the future. The trouble is, I found that the future is uncertainty rises exponentially faster than the discounting. My claim is that actually this present, this va present value does not exist in most cases. So this argument we calculate the fundamental price of an asset, it is in our mind. Nobody has proved to me that I can calculate the fundamental price of an asset which goes on forever and ever. Because we don't know what the future is. I said, if I try to, uh, you as a target, shoot you, I could make a bit of mistake, I still shoot you. But if you are in a moon and I try to shoot you, slight error, slightest error, I miss you. Right? You agree with that? Present value is the same. There's a, uh, there, uh, what I'm just saying, I published, Econometric Review, in, uh, 2007, with Alan Timmerman, one of his students. If you don't believe me, go and read it. Write me a paper, write a note to the publishers, say, I made a mistake. You cannot calculate these things. They are calculated because they believe they know the growth rate. When they calculate the present value, they assume they know the dividend, the, 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 the dividend yield. We don't know the dividend yield. You don't know whether this firm is going to be there. You have Lehman Brothers. You have to calculate the possibility of breakup of, or dropout of that company. Where do we calculate these things? 
we, are not, we should be honest to our public. We cannot use present value. Less honesty is a good idea. How can you calculate present value if you don't know anything about a year from now, leave alone 20, 30 years from now? Also, we don't know, even don't know how to discount the uh, future you know, uh, <laughs> cash flow. Yeah. Uh, I'm so, so sorry that uh, you know, it's unfortunate we have a time limitation. We have to stop. You know, uh, if you are interested in uh, SKBI event, we are going to uh, organize uh, SKBI annual conference uh, on May 7th. Continue on this subject matter. The, the theme for that uh, uh, SKBI annual conference is on uh, asset bubble, which is, of course, uh, related to you know, financial market inefficiency. Uh, to uh, you know, come along to uh, participate in this uh, you know, future SKBI event, uh, thank you for your support, and uh, have a pleasant day ahead.